Carl Wimmer, and uh, I give you permission to use this video to the glory of God. Now, I, I was born and raised in Utah, uh, born and raised as a Mormon. I uh, don't remember a, a time when I was not active. Uh, as a child, I was baptized at eight years old. I became a deacon at 12 years old, a teacher at 14, and a priest, uh, an LDS priest at age 16, and, and thereafter became an elder. Um, very active, very active in my childhood. Um, you know, did all the, the primary and the Cub Scouts and everything that, everything that has to do with uh, growing up as a young Mormon man, um, that's what I did. Um, I continued on. Uh, into adulthood, into Mormonism, and uh, and I loved it. I did. I, I I loved it at the time. And and uh, what did you love about it? You know, I I just didn't, I had a lot of friends. You know, all of my friends were Mormon. I I don't I don't recall having many friends uh, growing up that were not active in the in the church. Um, it, it was just so much a part of who you are socially. Uh, so much a part of who you are as you move from childhood into to the teen years. Uh, Mormonism is a huge part of who you are, and, and it was a huge part of who I was. I've heard some people describe being in a, what they call a Mormon bubble. Did you, did you feel like you were in the Mormon bubble? When you're, when you're in uh, Mormonism, you don't think you're in a bubble. Um, so no, I never really thought I was in a bubble. Looking back, clearly, I was in a bubble. And it, it, it's just, that's just the way it works. When you're inside of it, when, when you have the shields up, and when you uh, have that protective bubble, if you, as you call it, uh, over you, you don't realize that's where you are. Um, but looking back, uh, yeah, you definitely, you, you assume everybody is Mormon. You assume that Mormonism is so big. It is the world. It is life. Um, when you are raised a Mormon and you're raised in the LDS church, and especially in Utah, um, it, is, it is the world. And until you come out of it and look back, you really don't realize how small it really is um, and, and how blind you were. So, did you serve a mission? Yeah, I, I, I didn't serve a mission. I was worthy. I was worthy to serve a mission. Um, and it's something that uh, all of my adult Mormon life, it was the thing I regretted more than anything. I uh, would often talk, even as I became elders quorum president as an adult, I would often talk about how the biggest regret I have was not serving an LDS mission. Uh, I wanted to be a police officer, and I had the opportunity to go into the police academy um, when I was 20. And so I chose to do that. Um, but there was nothing that was holding me back from a mission. I could have gone. And uh, I remember at the time, it was the most conflicted I ever was at that point in my lifetime. And, and then, of course, it, that conflict grew into years and years of regret. So they Count you as second class if you're not a return missionary? Uh, as, as far as shunning me for not going on a mission, uh, th there was not a lot of it. However, there was a lot of curious questions. Mm -hmm. I would have people come up to me and pull me aside privately and say, hey, so what happened? You know, wink, wink, nod, nod. Uh, expecting a juicy story, finding out what did I do? What sin was I caught in? What, what made me unworthy. One friend of mine who was leaving on a mission and he said, hey, um, I know that uh, I'm leaving before you, but I hope you can become worthy to serve your mission and I'll see you when you get home. Not realizing that I, I was worthy and I, according to the LDS standards and I had not, there was no juicy backstory. I had just chosen to go into the police academy. And so that's, that's where that led. Um, but overall, I didn't feel a tremendous amount of shunning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. As you were growing up, were there any issues, any uh, things that caused you to question it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, looking back, yes. But at the time, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I was 
what I, I prided myself on uh, being a defender of the LDS faith. I remember many times I would get up as a man and I'd bear my testimony and, and say that I was willing to die for my faith. I was willing to die for Joseph Smith. I was willing to uh, give all I had. And that was a, a promise I made in the temple. All I had, including my life, if needs be, to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I meant it. Um, I'm a loyal person. Um, no, I was, I was so... As they say, I was so Mormon, a coffee table was against the word of wisdom. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I remember, uh, oh, oh, what a Pharisee I was. Um, I remember a couple times early in our marriage how I'd get, I, I got mad and angry at my wife when she brought home red wine vinegar to make salad dressing because it was red wine vinegar. Um, I also got mad at her another time for uh, enjoying a little too much, I thought, the Jack Daniels barbecue sauce that was on ribs. And uh, I took her to task for those things um, because I felt that those were a violation of uh, our standards and beliefs. And I was very cruel to her at those points in my life. You strove very hard to keep the letter of the law then. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Very much so, especially outwardly. Mm -hmm. um, especially outwardly. I struggled most of my life from really, unfortunately, from a very young age uh, until adulthood with pornography. Mm -hmm. But I always had ways of justifying it, always had ways of saying, well, you know, I'm getting better and this and that and I'm working on it. and. Um, but I was very condemning towards other people and their sins, whilst I was very uh, dismissive of my own. Talk a little bit about just the idea of the outward righteousness versus what's going on inside. You know, that is one thing that bothered me, um, even when I was a Mormon. It bothered me um, because that is... Mormonism, unfortunately, is an incredible amount of it is focused on the outward appearance. Um, if you have long hair, if you, uh, if you don't fit the mold, you have uh, tattoos, um, anything like that, you, you, are, uh, you are looked at differently. You just simply are. Um, I remember when I was Elders Quorum president, um, I had a mustache. I had a mustache. I've had facial hair most of my life, and I had a mustache. It was the cop thing, you know, you have a mustache. And I was asked and counseled many, many times to shave my mustache because the prophet and his counselors and his uh, apostles did not have mustaches, and I needed to dress and uh, be like them. Um, it, a lot of it's on the outward appearance, looking like you have it all together, looking, you know, and you have the home teachers coming over, you scramble and make the mad dash to vacuum and clean up your house and, and you tell your children not to argue and to have the toys put away so that you look like you have it all together. There is not a lot of genuine, sincere living life in Mormonism. A lot of it's a front and a facade that you put up and it bothered me. Um, Throughout the week, I had a very foul mouth. I, I, I would swear and cuss, and, uh, but on Sunday, I was as good as you could, I was as good as gold, you know? And I was not the only one because we'd go golfing or go fishing with the elders, and um, every once in a while they would get comfortable and they'd let loose with how they really felt and what they, and, and, and the vulgarity and the things that would come out. And, uh, but on Sunday, we were all putting on the white shirt and tie and shaving and looking good. Um, there was not a lot of genuine living, especially, uh, especially for a lot of the men. A lot of the people we talk to, they say, I may have looked good on the outside, and everyone yeah. else seemed to look good on the outside. <laughs> and so I'm struggling just to at least look like I'm perfect, even if... Uh, is that a dynamic that you're familiar oh, with? Oh, my goodness. You, you describe it perfectly. Absolutely. You look at other people and their exterior, and you think, wow. Why can't I be like them? Or you want to you know how bad it gets? 
Why can't my wife be like her? Why can't my family be like their family? Because of the exterior and the front you put out. You know, it is no hidden fact that Utah leads the nation. Uh, it's not even close. We lead the nation on prescription antidepressant use and abuse. And I have no doubt whatsoever that that constant competition, that constant, I'm no good compared to that person because I can put on a white shirt, I can look really nice, I can say all the right things, but I know where my heart is. I know that I'm a whited sepulcher full of dead man's bones. And I want to be righteous, but I look at all these other people who I thought were and it is depressing, and it is mind-numbing. It, it, ne it, never lets, you ne it never lets you go. Especially the women in the LDS Church, they are competing with one another to just look like you have it all together, and that you have a perfect life and a perfect family, and when it's just not true. But they can't admit it. You admit it, and you admit you're a sinner. And that's a no-no in the LDS Church. The verbiage is, well, nobody's perfect. We know that there was only one perfect person. It was Jesus. You know, that's what a Mormon will tell you. Absolutely. They know that nobody's perfect. But to admit that you have nothing that you can bring that uh, is worthy of a perfect Savior, that is language that is not used. To admit that you are a sinner, to admit that you, um, you're just a sinner and that you are saved by grace, that is something that is not talked about or admitted in the LDS Church. I remember one time <clears throat> I was giving a lesson in class and I asked all the men to put their heads down because uh, I wanted them to be honest. And I said, okay, if, if you were to die right now, how many of you are going to the highest kingdom of heaven? And out of maybe 30 men, I think two raised their hand. Um, so they all internally recognized that they don't measure up. Okay. Um, that was very telling to me. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. You never know. Um, the Book of Mormon says, for we, are no, we know we are saved by grace after all that we can do. What, what is that? How do you know that you're doing all you can do? I can tell you this. I've been, I was a Mormon for 38 years. And I can tell you, I was, I was Elder Quorum president for three, three and a half years, three years. And I was in charge of tracking home teaching numbers. Home teaching numbers never reached more than 50%. That means, you know, uh, male adults are issued, you know, they're given families, assigned families to go out and check on them every month. And our home teaching numbers in our elders quorum growing up and, and uh, into adulthood never was more than 50 or 60 percent. Well, was, are, are, does that mean that they're doing all they can do? Of course they're not. Of course they're not. They're shirking a very fundamental tenet of Mormonism. Are they going to the temple as often as they should? Um, who does all they can do and who reaches that limit? So you just, you simply never know. As a Mormon, you simply never, ever know truly if you're going to return to the presence of God or if you're going to be given some lower status in the eternities. There's no rest and peace. You know, walk us through life as, as you begin to confront, you know, what is it that was starting to bring you out? And wow. Well, looking back on things, um, as I said, I, I remember going uh, to general conferences and, and yelling at the street preachers and yelling at those who were up there evangelizing the Mormons. Um, I hated those people. I thought they were Satan worshipers. Man. I thought they were so evil for attacking God's true church. Um, I am not one who had a lot of questions about Mormonism. I always believed. So uh, my wife and I uh, got married um, shortly after I became a police officer. We were married in the Bountiful Temple. And uh, we were living a very active LDS life, living, living the way we should have been living, uh, so to speak, if you will. 
um, all the while doing things we probably shouldn't have been doing, but not recognizing it. And I got to tell you, there was not a lot of times there were in my life where I doubted. I was always the man that would get up and bear my testimony in church. Not a lot of men do that, at least they didn't in my wards. But I did. Almost every, almost every test, fast and testimony meeting, I'd get up and I'd bear my testimony, testifying to the truthfulness. But at some point, my testimony and my life started changing. And I didn't even notice the change. And I would have denied it if anyone had pointed it out. Um, you see, in Mormonism, God is attached to the church, and the church is attached to God. And so any blessings you receive from God, you automatically give credit to the LDS church. And they're so interwoven. Unfortunately, I think that's why a lot of people who, when they discover the truth of Mormonism, they become agnostic or atheist. They just don't know where to turn to. Well, my story is one of, of pride and arrogance, I guess. God had to break me down to a point where I was ready to be humble and receive him. And, and uh, I was, I think most people know, I was elected to the Utah House of Representatives in 2006. And uh, I quickly grew in status as a politician in Utah. I became one of the most uh, well-known state legislators around the, around the entire state of Utah. Um, I couldn't go anywhere and not be recognized, and I, I loved that. I loved the praise and recognition of man. I clearly remember coming home one day, having been a guest in New York City on the Glenn Beck TV show, because I had helped found this national organization that was getting a lot of attention. And so I was on the Glenn Beck TV show probably three, well, three times. I was on lots of national radio stations. And I came home and we held, held a rally at the Capitol. And there was thousands of people there. And when I walked out, it was as if Caesar had entered the Colosseum. The crowd went nuts when they saw me because here was the guy that was just on the Glenn Beck show and he's, he's doing good things. And I remember how I soaked that praise up like you could not imagine. It was the height of my arrogance. And it, it was a point in my life where I was still very active Mormon, but I was also very successful and I thrived on that success. So I decided to run for Congress. And in 2012, I ran for United States Congress. And it was at that point that God started to really humble me. And I'm so glad he did. Um, in 2012, I uh, was running and I was raising money and my campaign was going really perfect. Th there was nothing I could have done more. Uh, the, the newspapers had even labeled the district the Wimmer District because they had expected me to win. I, I was... I was practically picking out curtains in my office back in Washington, D.C. And uh, the day for the convention election came and I got crushed. It surprised everybody. It surprised the media. It surprised me. I was shell-shocked. Uh, but that wasn't quite enough to humble me yet. I just thought the voters got it wrong. Um, they were wrong. That's, I, I was the right person. They got it wrong. Well, within a few weeks, I... Uh, I had taken the leave of absence from law enforcement, and uh, within a few weeks I was hired in Nevada to be a political director and a fundraiser in Nevada for the Republican Party. And so I loaded up a car and headed down there just to find out that I really didn't actually have a job. Um, and this entire story played out in the media. Um, Carl Wimmer leaving Utah to go work for Nevada. Carl Wimmer coming back unemployed. It was at that point that I got on my face and I asked God, I said, what do you want? What do you want? Where do you want me? And he led me back to law enforcement in a small town in central Utah. And I had no idea why he led us there. But I soon found out. It was January of 2013 when I was at work and I was researching. It was, it was after hours and I was on the computer researching 
uh, some things for, I believe it was a lesson I was going to teach or help teach the following Sunday. Because as soon as my wife and I moved, um, we got very active in our LDS ward. And I should mention, you know, we had three kids by this time. Two of the three I had already baptized in the LDS church. I was very active. Well, I'm researching some things for this lesson or to help with this lesson, and I come across some very disturbing things about Mormonism, about their history. Things that I had not heard before. Um, specifically, I heard that uh, Joseph Smith may have gotten the idea for the Book of Mormon from another book called The View of the Hebrews. And this book, The View of the Hebrews, was written by a guy named Ethan Smith, no relation to Joseph, several years before the Book of Mormon ever came out. And Ethan Smith also happened to be a pastor, a Christian minister, and was the Christian minister for Oliver Cowdery, who was a friend or cousin of Joseph Smith and helped to write the Book of Mormon. Well, I, I thought that was odd. I had never heard it before. And I thought, well, I, I would like to see more about this. My faith is very strong. I have no doubt whatsoever that the church is true. I testified to it. I was a defender of it. So I, I, I wanted to get a hold of this book. So I wrote to a friend of mine who I knew was an evangelical minister. Um, I had met him during politics. He was very politically active. And, and I wrote to him and I said, do you happen to have a copy of this book called The View of the Hebrews? And he says, yes, I do. He says, it'll be in the mail tomorrow. And uh, he sent that book and another book called The Insider View of Mormon Origins by Grant Palmer. And I looked at that one, and, and Grant Palmer, of course, was LDS when he wrote the book. He was the head of the Institutes of Religion in California, and so I thought, that's a safe book to read. And so I started reading that book. And I can't even begin to tell you the visceral disgust I had for that man and for this book. As I was reading it, I got so angry inside, I threw the book on the ground and I, I talked out loud. I said, Grant Palmer, you're a liar and I'm going to prove you wrong. Because the things he was saying about the Mormon church, I had never heard. The things he was saying, I thought were absolute lies. So I absolutely, I set myself, dedicated myself to prove what he was saying wrong. To prove beyond any doubt that the LDS church was true. I sought out to defend the LDS Church. I had, I had done what uh, Dieter Uchtdorf has said. I doubted my doubts, and I went and I was going to fight to defend my faith. The more I dug, the more I come to a realization that Grant Palmer wasn't lying. Um, he was not lying when he talked about the issues with the Book of Abraham, when he talked about the Kinderhook plates, when he talked about the child brides that Joseph Smith had, or the fact that he married other men's wives and he'd send them on missions and then marry their wives, those were true, and it blew me away. There was a, this was probably, no, no, this was the darkest time of my entire life. Um, because I had mentioned earlier, God is attached to the church the church is attached to God. And if you throw out the, the, the truth of the LDS church, um, then you're throwing God out too. Well, one night, I was grumping around the house, just ornery, just a miserable person to be around. Uh, I'd be lying if I say thoughts of suicide were not a real thing. I was so depressed, so, so crushed. And finally, my wife asked me one night, she says, what's wrong with you? And I said, do you really want to know? And she says, yeah, I want to know. And she had no idea I was researching this stuff. I said, okay, brace yourself. Here it comes. And I unloaded everything on her, everything. And, and I remember saying, I said, I am so angry at God. I'm so mad at him because I am begging and I am pleading with God to show me his truth. And all he is doing is showing me that the LDS church is fake and a fraud. And my wife looks at me and she says, listen to what you just said. And that right there was the first time 
I ever actually considered the possibility that I had been fooled for 38 years. It was a shock. It was something I cannot even begin to describe to someone who hasn't gone through it because the church to someone who believes it is as true as anything you could imagine. It is so true. It is what truth is. And when that crumbles, it is the most, it's the most massive cognitive dissonance you ever experienced in your life. It is so odd to explain. So this darkness and this dread continued over me for a long, uh, several days, week, weeks. And, but God didn't leave me there very quickly. I continued to beg for his truth and his guidance. And it was uh, February 22nd. So a year, a month later, a month later in 2013, my wife and I for many years enjoyed contemporary Christian music. Um, even as Mormons, we would go to contemporary Christian concerts and, and we would be sitting there just in the back, you know, looking around at all these strange people with their hands in the air worshiping God and just wondering what they're doing. But we went to concerts for many years and we decided to go to a concert. It was uh, the Rock and Worship Road Show in Salt Lake City. Jeremy Camp was one of the people that was there. And at one point he set his guitar down and he pulled out his Bible. And he started preaching and he gave a message, the message of the cross. He gave the message of Jesus Christ and being willing to sacrifice everything to follow his truth. Right there, downtown Salt Lake City, as I sat in my chair, um, every ounce of pain, every ounce of heartache, every ounce of sorrow, and darkness that I had been feeling was washed away in a second as I come to know who Jesus Christ is in my life. Um, I was born again right there. And uh, what an amazing experience that was. I didn't even know how to process it. And uh, the Bible became alive to me. God's word became alive. One thing that I should mention, as a Mormon, sacrament meetings, the most boring talks to me were the ones when somebody would get up and read a lot from the scriptures. The scriptures were dead to me. I never consistently read my scriptures as a Mormon. I would have really strong moments where I would and really weak moments where I wouldn't. Most of the time, it, it, the Bible or the Book of Mormon came out on Sunday, went back on the shelf on Sunday night, and never came out until the next weekend. I had never imagined the feast, the spiritual feast that I would have after having the Spirit come inside and waken me up to who God was. And I, I oftentimes tell people because I changed. I became such a different human being. Um, I remember my little brother wrote to me on Facebook and said, what is wrong with you? Because Everything I was posting on Facebook was about Jesus Christ and about the Lord. And, and other friends were writing to me like, what is going on with you? And Jeremiah 20, verse 9, is, describes it perfectly. What happened and how I felt after God introduced himself to me. And it says, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as if it were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. I cannot stop talking about the amazing change that God made in my life. And uh, I praise the Lord that within the next several months, uh, my wife was born again and is just a firm, lo she loves the Lord. She loves Jesus Christ. She loves the Bible and uh, our children as well. And it has been an amazing experience. How was that process for them? Did that cause a lot of friction at first? My wife would tell you that she was a checklist Mormon by this point. 
she was, for all intents and purposes, spiritually dead. She, she was what I would call a social Mormon, someone who went to church and did the checklist, you know, visiting, teaching, you know, make sure you're doing everything you need to be doing, go to Relief Society, you know, go to the activities. But as far as a relationship, a, a passionate relationship with the Lord, there was nothing there. And she, God had brought her to a point where she was ready. Um, there was very little friction. There was some tension because we were nervous about how it was going to affect our kids. We even talked about at one point considered, can we raise our kids in a split religious family where she stays Mormon and, and I don't? We just didn't know what to do. She started reading the Bible. And she started reading the Bible um, as if it was true. You see, because when you're a Mormon, um, you're taught the Bible is the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. And what that means is this. It means that anything in the Bible that doesn't match up with what you're told by your Mormon leaders is wrong. So really, the Bible is, is really held in low regard in the LDS Church. I remember talking to um, a few years back to a Mormon friend of mine when I was still Mormon, and we were just talking about things, and he actually said, I wish the LDS Church would just get rid of the Bible. He actually said that. It didn't shock me for him to say that back then, but now it makes me, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because it's the only thing that's truth within that, that people have. Um, she started reading the Bible and many things stuck out to her. For instance, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then if you fast forward to John 1.14, and the Word became flesh. Who's the Word? Jesus is the Word. Jesus is God. That was something that was a revelation. That was something, whilst we revere Him as the Savior, He is not God in Mormonism. Heavenly Father is God, and Jesus is His literal spiritual Son. And then you, you go on to read John 1.18. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at His side, at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Okay? All of these things that contradicted the teachings of Mormonism. Uh, the woman at the well, God is a spirit, must be worshipped in spirit. Colossians, where it says... Jesus is the image of the invisible God. All of these things that contradicted Mormon teaching, that is what converted my wife. Reading the New Testament as if it was true converted my wife. And uh, I remember, you don't break out of this shell easy. I remember looking for a Christian church, and there's this church in Ephraim, the Ephraim Church of the Bible, and... I didn't know anything about it, and I was so nervous about going there. Um, and I have a whole funny story about that. I remember one time, we're still active Mormons, and I love to sing. I love to sing. Um, and I remember we were listening to Christian music, and we're driving through Ephraim, and we're active Mormons, but I see the sign that says, Ephraim Church of the Bible, four blocks this way. And I said, hey, babe, we, we, we should go there sometime. Maybe they'll let me sing with their worship team. I'm on their worship team right now. Uh, and we were, I was just joking, but as of today, I'm on their worship team singing with them. I, I, called, I called the pastor, Pastor Rodney, and I said, I'd just like to meet with you. I'm Mormon, but I'm having struggles. I'd like to meet with you. He says, sure, come out this afternoon. So I went and, went, met, went and met with him, and this is when the Mormonism started coming out in me because as soon as I met him, I was shocked because he has... A ponytail. He has long hair. And I thought, what is this? How can a follower of Jesus have long hair and look like a surfer? You know, I, I again, outside appearance. But as we sat down and we talked, and he didn't even need to open his Bible to quote from it, and his theology was so good. And I thought, this, this guy knows God. This man knows God, and I want to know God like he knows God.
So that next Sunday, I went to church by myself and kind of scoped it out. And I'm sitting there in my white shirt and tie and everybody else is dressed. You know, I, I stuck out like a sore thumb. <laughs> but the worship music, they played some music I recognized. So I'm holding up my phone, recording it, and I text Sherry and say, hey, look at this. And well, long story short, my whole family went the next week. But we also went to the LDS church. We were going to a couple different churches. And it, Four and a half hours of church on Sunday. Yeah, for two weeks. Because we were terrified. We had just told our daughter, all our whole lives, we had raised her up to love Joseph Smith. We, la- we raised her up to love someone that really wasn't what we had taught her. She knew nothing about the fact that, I mean, she's 13 now, another year, and she'd be the same age as Joseph Smith's wife, Helen Mar Kimball. And we didn't know what to do. Well, praise God. Within two weeks of going to both churches, we were driving from Ephraim Church of the Bible and heading over to the LDS ward, and our kids said, we don't want to go there anymore. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And I I just wanted to cry. I was so happy. And um, So since then, in in the year, two years since that point, my daughter has... uh, been baptized. Um, she is a on fire teenager for Jesus, evangelizing her friends. Um, my oldest son, who, who's 11, he too has been baptized. And uh, our family is just on fire for Jesus Christ. That's awesome. So, That's awesome. As far as the process of coming out, it was tough. It was tough. Living in Utah, uh, being a public figure the way I was, there was a time where I couldn't sneeze and the newspaper didn't put it in the paper, you know, off, you know, legislator, representative Wimmer this, representative Wimmer that. We were really nervous. Uh, the first hurdle was to tell our parents and our family. Um, it was so easy telling my family. Um, my dad is an absolute born again Christian and I didn't even know it necessarily. Um, he has been so supportive and he calls me and he, and, and we'll joke around, we'll talk the, about the Bible. And, um, my family has been really supportive. Um, uh, my dad is a faithful man, a, a good Christian man. And, uh, and so they, our family took it well. I have some brothers who are more agnostic and, and, and atheist and that kind of thing. And so they just kind of fell away from the church and they couldn't care less one way or the other. Sherry's family was different. They are almost all active, um, LDS. And we made a couple errors, of course. Um, Sherry felt that sending them an email would be the best way to communicate this. She knows her parents, she knows her family, and, and so I kind of deferred to her. And so she prepared this very eloquent, very beautiful email to go out and tell her parents and her family that we're leaving the LDS church. And uh, it was all prepared and she took a week to write this thing or longer and uh, she sent it on April 1st and uh, yeah who says God doesn't have a sense of humor she had to quickly send a follow-up email saying oh wow this is not April Fool's joke sorry and uh, so her parents stopped talking to us for about a month Um, and just would not let us explain ourselves, would not let us talk about the thing that was the single most important thing in our life. And that hasn't really changed, um, unfortunately. Uh, her father blocked me on Facebook. Um, fine, whatever. Um, I, love, I love them, and uh, we pray for them every single day. Uh, there is a relationship there. There is, but it's not the same, and I pray it will be one day. I pray it will be even better as they discover the truth for themselves. But religion is completely off topic. It it, it is something that cannot be discussed with them. They will not discuss it. They will completely ignore any type of discussion about religion. And that's hard because the most important thing in my life and the most important thing in the life of my family is Jesus Christ. When you have experienced and you have received such a massive blessing, and when your heart 
belongs to the Lord. You want so badly for others to know what that feels like. And so we may have pushed too hard at the beginning, um, and they, the shields are up, you know, it's like Star Wars, shields up, and they are up, and they will not listen. But we pray that God will break through that, and uh, God is faithful, and we have faith that He will continue to uh, work in their life as we plant the seeds, you know. But it's, it's hard, because I have an evangelistic heart. My heart belongs to Jesus Christ, and I want so badly for those who don't know Him to know Him. So that, that's how we do this. So. Yeah, yeah. This, this is a great thing. I, it's so important that people who are struggling with their faith, who are in a crisis of faith, who, who aren't really sure where to go, to know that there is life after Mormonism. You do not have to throw out God with the church just because the LDS church has corrupted the good words of the Bible. And just because they've corrupted what Jesus Christ did and said does not mean there's not truth out there. Just because the Mormon church is not true does not mean there's not truth out there. And that's a hard thing for ex-Mormons to come to grips with. But once they do and they realize that they can rely on the Bible, they can rely on Jesus, there is such a beautiful life outside of the LDS church, you can't even begin to imagine it. Um, I, often tell, I oftentimes tell people, I have tasted and seen the finest things that Mormonism has to offer. And I have tasted the finest things that a relationship with Jesus Christ has to offer. And they cannot be compared. It is like comparing a flashlight with dead batteries to the noonday sun. It's not comparable. Almost immediately, I enrolled at Liberty University, and I, um, because I, I was a, I felt like a thirsting, starving man who had been in a desert for 38 years, and had had a taste of living water, and I wanted more. I wanted it to consume me, um, and so I knew that I had a lot of baggage. I had a lot of things that. I was going to have to unwind things that what's Mormon theology versus Christian theology. And so I enrolled in, Univer in Liberty University um, online, and I'm getting my bachelor's in theology right now. That was priceless. It's still priceless. The theology classes that I learned uh, and, and took there helped quickly to unwind the 38 years of really heretical teachings that I had uh, consumed and believed. Um, it, it still was tricky. It was especially tricky for my wife, um, where you'd hear a story and you weren't sure, is that a Mormon story or is that a Bible story? Um, and I talk to kids all the time. Now, young people, uh, young adults who say, they'll say, tell me about your religion. We'll get into a conversation. They say, okay, well, um, Jonah and the whale, is that Book of Mormon, or is that? No, that's in the Bible. Okay, what about the guy that was in the lion's den? No, that's Bible. Uh, you know, and you have to really separate the two. And it is a process, and it's still a process, coming to grips with biblical truth versus what you learn as a Mormon. Um, but what a wonderful experience it's been. It, and it's been great. My kids, all of them, all of them, even my youngest, who is eight, know more about the Bible now than I did as a 38-year-old Mormon. Now, there's plenty who will say, oh, that's my fault. I, I take, absolutely, it's my fault. But there's also a culture, a culture that says the prophet is more important than the scriptures. If you need to know something, the prophet will tell you. That kills the scriptures for you, okay? Why do I need the Bible? when I have a living prophet? Why do I need to read old stories that are irrelevant to me today if I have a living prophet? That is so damaging. And I tell you, I'm not the only Mormon who felt that way. I'm not the only Mormon who feels that way right now. But once you realize that this is God's living word, it changes everything.
it changes everything. And uh, so, looking, uh, looking back at maybe the last 10, 15 years, I can see where God was calling me out, but I didn't feel it then. Um, everything from, uh, I, I, my brother-in-law and I, we competed on an international level in powerlifting, weightlifting competitions. And um, there was a super strong, they're called the, the power team. They're a Christian group of strong men who go around and preach and do st feats of strength. And back in 1999, my brother-in-law went and watched them and heard their sermon. Um, Christian music played a role. Um, the cross I'm wearing, well, at least the chain part, the actual cross I put away for a keepsake, but this gold chain and there was a gold cross on it, um, I bought when I was still LDS. Why? I don't know. It was pretty. I bought it, but I, I never wore it because the cross is something you don't wear in the LDS church. Several years before we came out, my family and I went to California, and we were on the beach, and these Christians came down there baptizing people in the ocean. I stood up and I walked to the edge of the water and I just watched and I was enthralled and I was just so happy for them people. And I walked back and I sat with my wife and she says, you are obsessed. And I said, obsessed with what? And she says, obsessed with Christian things right now. And it's, it, in a way I was. I saw my testimony in the LDS church start to change, although I didn't really recognize it. I remember, I'd still get up and bear my testimony, but it was always about Jesus. When my son was baptized, when I baptized him at eight years old, the next Sunday they asked uh, him to get up and read his favorite scripture. So he said, Dad, I'm supposed to read a favorite scripture. What should I read? I said, oh, okay, go up and read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by grace that you are saved through faith and not of works lest any man should boast. And he's like, okay, now go up and read that. I was doing things without knowing why. God was pulling me out long, long before we ever left. And so that's why I just, I encourage people and my wife and I, God was so patient with us that if, if you have people who you're praying over and wanting them to know the truth and to uh, have God's truth revealed to them, um, it takes some time. It takes a long time. For me, it probably took 12 years of unwinding and, and of God, pl people planting seeds. Um, another seed, and I sought this man out because I wanted him to know how much I appreciated his kindness. Uh, I was involved in a, it, it was a, quite a violent situation as a police officer when I was at work, and um, it bothered me. And uh, it was kind of eaten at me for a few days. and. Um, they had a chaplain service at the police department that I worked for. All the chaplains were non-LDS. And I called one of them and I said, hey, can I meet with you? And he met with me 11 o'clock at night, prayed with me. It was an odd prayer. It wasn't a Mormon prayer, but I remember how much this man fed into me and, and just, just loved on me. And that planted a seed. And uh, after I came to Christ, I looked him up. He moved out of Utah and he's a pastor back east, uh, or excuse me, back south, in the south. And I looked him up and I said, I don't know if you remember me. And he says, I sure do. And I said, well, I've been born again. I've come to the Lord. And he celebrated, you know, he was excited. And just small things like that, that I see where the Lord was working in my life. Well, as I talk to LDS people, I, I, I have a heart for them. My heart breaks. Um, because they, it, it, I, I know what it's like. I know what it's like to be LDS and to believe you have the truth. To know beyond a shadow of a doubt you have the truth. That's a famous word, famous paraphrase or a phrase that we say. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was true. But I didn't know what I didn't know. You just, you don't know what you don't know. And until you are willing to look, you'll continue to walk in darkness. Um, the thing is, there's a tremendous amount of fear. Not only fear of social rejection, but fear that 
looking outside of Mormonism is something that is evil and wrong. I just tell people this. You have to want truth more than you want to be comfortable. Because it is not comfortable coming out of Mormonism. And it is not comfortable living an authentic life at times, especially in our culture. But the fact is, what God can do in your life is, is something that I can't even begin to explain. From morning until night now, my heart is full of praise for our Lord. What He has done for me and my wife and our family, bringing us from the darkest parts of our life to walking in the light of Jesus Christ. I would beg and plead with the Mormon people not to be afraid to question, not to be afraid to get on their face and beg God for the truth. Look for the truth. Research. You see, the Bible says the heart is deceitful. Above all else, who can know it? It's, it's desperately wicked. Yet it is the main thing that Mormons rely on for truth. They don't rely on historical records because there are none. They don't rely on archaeological records because there are none. I can go today and I can go to the city of Jericho. I've held a piece of the wall from Jericho in my hands. I can visit where Christ walked. I can stand where he stood. But there is no city of Zarahemla. There is no city of Nephi. We can't even find a sword or a shield or a helmet that confirms any of the Book of Mormon stories. They rely solely on their testimonies within their heart. But the Bible never tells us to do that. Yes, feelings are important, but so is the intellect. God gave us an intellect. And I would just encourage the LDS people to not be afraid to look, not be afraid to look outside the box, and do not be afraid to trust God. Because trusting God is the smartest thing you could ever do in your life. Have you had a chance to meet Grant Palmer and change your mind about him? <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have not met Grant Palmer, but I would love to meet Grant Palmer someday and just shake his hand and uh, have him hear my story. Because he went from being someone that I may have physically assaulted if I met to someone who I would embrace for planting a horrible seed in my life that blossomed. Um, yeah, I, if I could say to Grant uh, one thing, it's just that uh, God's using him. God's using him to do good things, um, even though it's painful. <laughs> so. This is for Mormons who um, are questioning, Mormons who um, may not be sure if they have the full truth. I, I, think, it's, I think it's multifaceted. Um, looking into the problems with the LDS Church is definitely a, a good step. It's something people need to do. You need to know the truth about the Book of Abraham. You need to know the truth about the Book of Mormon and how we got it. You need to know the truth about Joseph Smith. But those things, while they're beneficial, will not lead you to Christ. If I were to tell Mormon to do one thing, it is to open the Bible. It is to open the Bible and begin to read it as if it is actually true. Be and I know that's weird to say it that way, but a Mormon will know what I'm talking about. You need to read the Bible as if every word is factual and true, because it is. It is. And even if you don't believe it at first, you have to pretend that it's all true. And then beg God to show you uh, His truth, reveal Himself to you, and God will be faithful to do that. Um, it breaks my heart, the amount of Mormons who leave the LDS Church but don't land in relationship with Christ. That is, if I were to say the worst thing that LDS doctrine does is ma it makes you believe that if it's not true, there is not truth out there. 
and that even if it's false, it's the right way to live. They say that. The leaders say that. Well, those two statements are absolutely wrong. There is truth. The truth is found in Jesus Christ. The truth is found in the Bible. And I would just strongly encourage anyone who is having a faith crisis in Mormonism to not throw the Bible out with the, the Book of Mormon. Because the Bible is a rock that has been beaten on for thousands of years and it still stands as the world's best seller for a reason. Because it's truth. It's God's truth. There are so many misconceptions that Mormons have about biblical Christians. It's, it's laughable to look back at it. Um, the first one, I think, is... Well, there's two big ones. The first one is they believe that all biblical Christians are modalists. And what I mean by that is they do not understand the triune God at all. Now, God is incomprehensible. The Bible tells us this, okay? He is someone that we cannot fully grasp the greatness and the size and all the aspects of God, okay? But they think that most biblical Christians uh, have a hard time explaining uh, that there's three, okay? This is not an issue for most of us. However, I, whenever I talk to a Mormon uh, and we have a friendly debate, he'll say, okay, well, I got a question for you. He'll say, who was saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased when Jesus was being baptized? I said, well, that was God the Father. And that blows them away because, again, they think that we believe there's only one. They, they just don't grasp it. Um, the second thing that Mormons believe about Christians is they believe that we fully embrace uh, antinomianism. Now, for those that don't know what antinomianism, it is this. They believe that Christians believe that once you say the Savior's prayer, that you believe in Jesus, that you can go out and rape and pillage and murder and rob and live this, this vile life and still be good with God, and still go to heaven. They completely misunderstand grace. They completely misunderstand the grace of Jesus Christ. That once you've been born again, He changes your heart. You don't have a heart to go out and rob and pillage and, and do things that are evil. You have a heart for God. And so those are probably the two biggest misconceptions that they believe that biblical Christians um, can feel like we can do whatever we want now that we're saved by grace, and also that we, they don't understand the triune God in, at all. Um, another misconception that I had was thinking that biblical Christians don't really attend church that much. Um, that, that they go once in a while, but they really don't go to church. They're not active. Um, righteous people. Oh, boy, I was wrong. Boy, was I wrong. That, that was more of my belief, I think, but uh, still a misconception. Yeah. yeah. How then do you deal with uh, sin in your life, the actual reality of, of sin in our lives as a Christian? Oh, wow. You know, if I could just say this about the fact that God changes your heart, um, my home is so much more peaceful than it used to be. I, I had uh, a problem with rage. I was a man of anger. I, uh, I would go into these intense rages where I wouldn't hurt anybody, obviously, I, I, but I'd break things. I would bust things, and I'd cuss and swear and knock holes in the wall. and It, it was a terrifying thing for someone to watch. Um, God made me as meek as a lamb. I have not had a, a rage episode since coming to Christ. He completely changed my heart in that regard. Um, so supernaturally that there is no way it can be explained other than God doing it for me because I had tried to change many times before. Um, does that mean I'm perfect? No, of course not. You know, um, I am definitely bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
And every single day I try to live a life that honors Him. But we're sinners. And that's the one thing, such genuine people within the body of Christ. It blows you away. The first time my wife and I are standing there and a a dear sister comes up to us in the church and says, hey, can you guys just keep me in prayer this week? My husband and I are really struggling in our marriage. I was like, such honesty. That would not happen in an LDS ward. Wouldn't happen because you have to act like you have it all together. We're like, absolutely. And let me pray for you now. And so you pray for them right then and there. And then you keep her in prayer. And, you know, their marriage is, it, it, God has healed their marriage. But it blew us away how honest people are. Um, when they're struggling with their kids, they don't hide it. They, they ask you, they say, look, my child is struggling with their faith, that my child is having issues at school. Please pray for them. It's just a genuine life. Um, and when you do something that uh, you know God isn't happy with, you just take it to Him. You take it to the Lord, and, and, you, and you make it right with Him. You know, you, you, you are not accountable um, to men. You're accountable to God. And that is a huge change from Mormonism and Christianity, um, the whole repentance process, if you will. Um, just dealing with sin in your life now is, is you and God. You know, it's the most amazing thing in the Bible that most people don't even think about. And in fact, as you go through the lessons, my wife um, is going, every Sunday reads the Gospel Doctrine lessons from the LDS Church because her father is the Gospel Doctrine teacher. And so she prepares a lesson and emails it to him based off of what he is going to teach that week in hopes that he'll read truth. When Christ was crucified and the veil was torn, that section of Scripture is completely skipped over in Gospel Doctrine. Half of the book of Romans is skipped over. The, almost the entire book of Galatians, obviously, because the entire book of Galatians is about grace and grace alone, um, is skipped over. But the veil tearing is so symbolic. It absolutely shows when Christ died, the, the veil that separated man from God was ripped apart and we now have direct access to Him. And we don't need these people to stand in our way to give us access to Him. And that is something that Mormons don't grasp and, and it's just not part of their theology. The veil has been sewn up and is in every temple in, throughout the church. A lot of people that I know within the LDS church are what I would term practical atheists. And most of them would take offense at that, but let me explain what I mean by that. What I mean by that is this, that they go to church and they go through the motions, but God does not affect their life throughout the week. He does not affect who they are um, internally. Um, they live the life they want, and then they go to church on Sunday. And all the outside things, I mean, they wouldn't be caught dead holding a cup of coffee or, a, or holding a beer in their hand or, or the things that people can see. But when they're alone, and many of the men I know are consuming pornography, Many of them are lusting after other women and, and vice versa. Women are suffering with depression, abusing antidepressants. God has not changed them from the inside. And I posted that on Facebook, um, very friendly, just saying, you know, practical atheism is when you go to church on Sunday but live as if God doesn't exist the rest of the week. And a gentleman who is a staunch Mormon wrote, he says, yeah, you have to fake it until you make it. I was so sad when I read that because no, you don't. Not if you know God. Not if you have the Spirit living inside of you. You don't have to fake it. And I, if I could give a message to so many Mormons out there, you don't have to fake it. You can live a genuine life, a genuine God-honoring life. It doesn't mean you have it all together, but it also means you're not pretending that you do. 
And it also means that God is transforming who you are. You are being refined every day through Him. What a glorious way to live and a glorious way to be. And I just, I want that for my LDS brothers and sisters and my family. I, I want that for them. Um, so God got me into politics. You know, it was an odd thing getting into politics. Um, I never intended to run for office. I had no intention of running for office, but there was some things that I was very passionate about, very strong pro-life issues. Uh, I ran many of the abortion bills uh, that passed in the last 10 years or ones that I ran. Um, I almost wonder if God put me in a position to be publicly known so that I could publicly leave the LDS church. You see, when I left the LDS church, it was on the front page of the Salt Lake Tribune. Front page Salt Lake Tribune, former Representative Wimmer, God led me from Mormonism. Right there on the front page. I wanted to hide under the bed when this was coming out, but the Salt Lake Tribune sent a reporter to our church, took photos of me, Wiles in church, and that's, it was a big story. That story has led a lot, not a few, a lot of Mormons to contact me and say, I'm having issues, I'm struggling. How did you find faith when you've lost it in Mormonism? I just, I praise God that he was able to use my embarrassment for that. I'd be lying if I said, I did not still, I, I wanted to run for office still. I wanted to get back into the legislature. Um, God had other plans for me. And uh, in two weeks, I'll be flying to Washington, D.C. to meet with uh, Capital Ministries. Capital Ministries is an evangelical Christian group that ministers to politicians the Word of God. They are set up in Washington, D.C., and they're setting up throughout the state, and they've asked me to be the Capital Ministry State Director in Utah. And so I'm going back to a training, and I have a lot, I, I know everybody who's in elected office. I, I know Governor Herbert and everyone from him down, and uh, we're going to see what God can do at the state capitol in the next coming years. Mm -hmm.